Welcome to Human Stories, or in the case of my presentation today, Post-Human Stories. My name is John Bolesky, and I'm a social cultural anthropologist at the University of California in San Diego. And today I'll be talking about transhumanism and specifically religious transhumanism. My focus will be the people who make up the largest and oldest religious transhumanist organization in the world, the Mormon Transhumanist Association. Hopefully this conversation will help us better understand a variety of different things. The relationship between science and religion, uh, some dynamics happening right now in the Mormon faith. And finally, some aspects of transhumanism as a social, as opposed to a cultural or intellectual phenomenon. But of course, this is only uh, relevant if you know something about transhumanism. Transhumanists are people who are either working on or advocating for near future technologies so powerful that they will, in essence, allow us to escape limits that we as a species have always had define us and thus allow us to transcend the human condition. We're speaking about medical technologies that allow us to cure aging as if it was a disease, about uploading human minds to computers, about easily hacking one's genome. Uh, we're talking about cryonics, that is preserving the dead in liquid nitrogen so they can be resurrected in the future. And we're also talking about nanotechnology, which would produce machines that work as the, at a subcellular -cell scale and also general artificial intelligence, which would produce computers smarter than any unaugmented human by several orders of magnitude. When people think about transhumanists, there's a tendency to imagine James Bond villain-like captains of industry like Elon Musk or inventors like Ray Kurzweil. But it's not all just scientists, engineers, science fiction writers and futurists. Many transhumanists are just enthusiasts, captivated by the possibilities they see into speculation about what technologies like this might mean when they come into existence. Now, transhumanism has multiple roots. It's informed by things such as the mid 20th century work on cybernetic systems and by cutting edge United States military research endeavors. And Silicon Valley has influenced and been influenced by transhumanism. But transhumanism also has roots in things like the 1960s countercultural and lay space and science advocacy groups. Now, transhumanism, in a sense, is a global phenomenon. Transhumanists range from Russian cosmicists to Afrofuturists. But the center of gravity for transhumanism is the United States of America. And while American transhumanists are a varied bunch, they tend to be libertarian leaning and iconoclastic. They also tend to be atheists and often new atheists, people who are not just personally skeptical about religious truth claims, but actually hostile to religion having any role in the public sphere. So it's surprising that in addition to what we may call secular transhumanists, there are also some religious transhumanists. There's Buddhist transhumanists, Muslim transhumanists, Hindu transhumanists, evangelical transhumanists, even transhumanist religious groups that have no affiliation with any pre-existing religious body at all. But the oldest, largest, and best organized transhumanist organization in the world is the Mormon Transhumanist Association. To understand why that might be the case, it helps to know a bit about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, an organization that's often colloquially referred to as the Mormon Church. This religious movement was founded by Joseph Smith back in the early 19th century in upstate New York. Smith understood himself to be a prophet. He was either the author or translator, depending on how you interpret his claims, of uh, several sacred texts, including most famously, the Book of Mormon. Two things are relevant for our conversation today. The first thing is that several Mormon tenets distinguish that religion from other forms of Christianity. And these differences also make it simpatico with transhumanism. One Mormon idea that rhymes with transhumanism is that of exaltation. Over time, faithful Mormons can achieve godhood, just as, according to Mormon understanding, God was himself in the past a man and achieved godhood himself. The idea that 
God is an achieved position. It means that God did not set the laws of nature. Therefore, miracles, rather than being suspensions of the natural law, as is understood in most Christian traditions, are, are instead a more subtle use of natural law by God. For Mormons, this makes miracles a kind of technology. What's more, Mormonism also is a materialist religion. This seeming oxymoron means that Mormonism holds that even spirit in, is matter, a more subtle form of matter, but comprised of matter all the same. It is, in short, a post-Copernican, post-Newtonian faith, which makes sense considering Mormonism's 19th century American origins. The second thing is that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is a highly centralized institution that disciplines and shapes the lives of its believers, even as those believers have a very deep attachment to it. To understand why, you need to know something about the history of the faith. After Joseph Smith and his brother were lynched in 1844, the main body of Latter-day Saints resettled in Utah, hoping to escape further mob, mob violence. Once they reached Utah, uh, they evolved a distinct culture shaped not by any paid clergy, there is effectively no paid clergy in Mormonism, but by individuals who are asked to give their time and energy. Eventually, kinship networks, social circles, and even careers and business ventures all became laminated together within the church. Even today, where there are more Mormons uh, outside the United States than inside the country, Utah still has an outsized role in shaping the faith. Utah Mormons tend to be highly educated, in part due to the church's heavy investment in educational institutions like Brigham Young University. Because of these levels of education, and in part because of the work ethic and sobriety associated with uh, Mormons, there's been a heavy investment in Utah by the tech sector. But when this trend first started to take hold in the early years of the 21st century, there were more jobs than people uh, with degrees in computer science or comparable fields. And there are also a lot of young men looking for jobs. Since there is a particularly strict sanction on any sexuality outside of wedlock and a privileging of heteronormative monogamous marriage, Mormons tend to marry very early and have children very quickly as well. All this meant that Utah Mormons with degrees in fields like linguistics, philosophy, or music ended up looking and finding jobs in the tech sector. Since they didn't have technology backgrounds, they were more likely to ask different, more existential questions about the nature and role of technology. At the same time, many of these young Mormon men were starting out in the technology sector. They also began discussing and sometimes debating uh, one another on computer messaging boards and early religion-focused websites and forums like BeliefNet. One of the topics that they began to speculate about was whether uh, the sort of eschatological promises that made by Mormonism about the resurrection of the dead or exaltation that is effectively becoming gods might be achieved through technological means. This is a question that wouldn't make sense in most other religious traditions, but because of the tenets of Mormonism that we just discussed, it made sense in their world. The initial idea was that when God created the world as part of the process of testing and educating his children, he provided this world with the affordances necessary for humans to realize these promises of resurrection and godhood themselves. Soon, they learned about similar secular intellectuals, that is, transhumanists who appeared to be thinking the same thing. It turned out that Mormon doctrines such as theosis, miracles as technology, and the material nature of spirit made it easy for them to translate back and forth between Mormon and transhumanist thought. Transhumanist dreams of overcoming the human condition ended up looking a lot like Mormon aspirations for exaltation. And the near, near miraculous technology anticipated by transhumanists lined up nicely with the doctrine of technology as miracles held by Mormons. Once they started reaching out to the broader Mormon world, they found an audience for their message. Through conferences, publications, and primarily through online research, they quickly grew to over a thousand members. Why was transhumanism so attractive to this set of Mormons? Well, part of it is it gave them a way to connect their work with technology and their religious faith. And they also got a rationalist account of their faith that they could give to their non-Mormon colleagues in the tech sector. And have it not sound odd. Instead of being seen as religious obscurants, they now came across as science-centered transhumanists. 
But perhaps the largest attraction uh, to transhumanism for Mormons was how it changes the way that they can relate to Mormonism. To understand this, we have to remember that both directly and indirectly, the internet catalyzed much of the activity that established Mormon transhumanism. The internet allowed for these positions to exist. Uh, it was a forum that brought them together and housed the, their debates, and it was how they began to organize and reach out to others. But the internet also changed things for many Mormons who are not interested in transhumanism. Mormons of all stripes found a platform on the internet, and people who thought that they were alone with questions, concerns, and enthusiasms found one another and formed an online community that was sometimes referred to tongue-in-cheek as the bloggernacle. Just as Mormon transhumanists began debating the relationship between technology and exaltation, other Mormons communicated about and debated aspects of the church that interested them. And the interests and the internet had a lot of advantages, uh, a large potential audience, low investment costs, and for the most part, limited gatekeeping. You see, the internet allowed Mormons to discuss and organize directly with one another without any gatekeeping or policing by, by the institutional church. Most of the media that addressed the Latter-day Saints was either formally or informally uh, associated with the church, or it was brought out by forces that were openly hostile to the church like evangelicals who are constantly trying to convince Mormons to leave what the evangelicals understood as being a false religion. The church-related media, church media wouldn't allow for any negative depictions, and criticism from the outside media was dismissed as anti-Mormon lies. But this meant there was no real space for debates about topics such as how women were treated, they were denied any real substantive leadership roles, and they're presented subservient to their husbands. Uh, racism, the church had banned blacks and from full membership in the church until 1978. The way that LGBTQ members are treated, homosexuality, homosexuality is considered both choice and sin. And the church had backed many anti-gay marriage initiatives. Finally, there were issues of Mormon history, details about the nature of the now renounced 19th century doctrine of Mormon polygamy, uh, and also including Joseph Smith's marriages to underaged wives, or how the Book of Mormon came about into being, for instance, and learning these things through the internet when these forums became established and people start discussing them was a lonely experience. Because discussing it in church is oftentimes discouraged by social norms. And it's also difficult to speak about with fellow Mormons who aren't already a part of these internet discussions. This inability to talk about these issues often aggravated the situation because it made fellow Mormons who aren't going through this doubt appear to those Mormons who were conformist, closed-minded, and sometimes ignorant of their own religion. Still, learning this in information via the internet made many want to reform the church or leave it. In fact, this disruption of religiosity is so common that Mormons have developed a specific name for this phenomenon, uh, which they refer to as having or going through a faith crisis. And a whole industry has developed helping people navigate the shock of these faith crises because it is a shock. Recall that leaving the Mormon faith is difficult is a difficult, painful thing. Culture, a sense of self, family, marriage, sexuality, friendships are all tied up so tightly with being a part of the Mormon church that picking on one thread could make your whole life seem to unravel. So this is leaving people with a painful choice to either stay inside a religion that they no longer have faith in or leave the church and also leave many aspects of their lives that are important to them. But sometimes the choice wasn't theirs to make. Unnerved by this uh, effervescence of doubt being fed by the internet, the institutional church has engaged in a series of excommunications in an attempt to jettison and discredit online critics. There are few Mormon transhumanists who haven't gone, at least partially, through a faith crisis. Some chose to leave, some chose to remain. Mormon transhumanists who have uh, left the church, and also those that stayed in the church in the wake of this explosion of information on the internet, uh, still are welcome as a part of the Mormon Transhumanist Association. 
Mormon transhumanists who end up leaving the church have found in Mormon transhumanism a community where they can play with Mormon concepts and enjoy a Mormon sociality without having to engage with an official church they're now quite skeptical about. What's particularly useful is that the aspects that Mormon transhumanist focuses on are the ports of Mormonism that many of these people who left the church miss the most, the imaginative sweep of the religion, the way that Mormonism encourages a kind of theological speculation, and the grandeur of the promises regarding the afterlife. So Mormon transhumanism became a way for them to perform their Mormonism, to salve some of their wounds caused by leaving the church. But Mormon transhumanism also does work for those who stay in the church as well. Leaning into a naturalistic explanation as to how Mormon es eschatological promises will be kept not only allow for the privileging of science and engineering as a path to salvation, it also places the burden of achieving those promises on the members themselves, that is, the members who are alive today. Future technological and social achievement becomes more important than prior promises made by men who did not yet fully understand the processes through which these eschatological hopes would be realized because they could not imagine the technologies involved. And this advancement suggests that neither earlier nor current iterations of the church have it exactly right. We would expect both error in the past and improvement as we move towards the future. This does not mean that the past is unimportant. The 19th century tradition of religious speculation is a large part of uh, many Mormon transhumanist stock and trade. But past error is just past error, not a sign that the church is untrue as it is for those who have a more supernatural understanding of the church. Rather, error is just an indication that things are unfolding the way one might expect. And improvements in all sorts of areas from the church's policy regarding race to how LGBTQ Mormons are treated should be expected. So, what do we get from all this? First, Mormon transhumanism lets us know a common narrative regarding religion and science isn't true. While science and religion have different relationships in different times, it's commonly said that in the modern West, the truth claims regarding science and the truth claims made by religion are irreconcilable. And that if one thinks deeply on both of these ways of framing the world, considering them as something more than instrumental ways, you find that they are incompatible. But Mormon transhumanists not only are deeply invested in both science and religion, they've actually created a vision of the world where, at least to their minds, these two categories collapse into one another. This, is, this suggests that these two modes of thought don't have to be locked in enmity. Second, it teaches us something about transhumanism. Many critics of secular transhumanism say that transhumanism isn't so secular at all, that it's just a form of religious thought so disguised that transhumanists don't even recognize its true religious nature at all. This is so much the case that many call the vision of incredibly life-altering, rapidly occurring, technologically driven change so important to transhumanists, uh, the rapture of the nerds. Mormon transhumanism suggests that this is in some ways true, but also in some ways false. The hopes of secular transhumanists were legible to Mormon transhumanists, but they were not identical. Even though they were shockingly similar, the material had to be explicitly recoded as religious in order to do the social work of religion. Even in a transhumanist friendly religion, transhumanism had to be changed to act like religion instead of merely seeming similar to religion. Third, this teaches us something about how to study transhumanism and also about how to study movements like transhumanism that are centered on imaginative visions of possible worlds. When writing about transhumanism, there's a tendency amongst academics for, to focus on the logic of the transhumanist imagination. What kind of technological futures do transhumanists imagine? And how could these futures be critiqued and categorized? Are they to be desired or feared? Could we really overcome our humanity? Is that something that we want to do? These are important questions. And in my written work, I've addressed them as well. 
Uh, however, these issues are so beguiling that they distract us from the real reasons that people become interested in movements like transhumanism. Focusing on the intellectual content of transhumanist ideas obscures the fact that these transhumanist ideas occur because of concrete social conditions that themselves have nothing to do with transhumanism. It's not the purity of the idea of transhumanism that made Mormon transhumanism come into existence, but a series of concrete and contingent social phenomena, the demographic profile of Mormons, the need of the technology sector for certain kinds of workers, and the existence of communicative technologies like the internet. And these movements are attractive, not just because of their inherent appeal, but also because they work in the non-transhuman aspects of the lives of the people who invest so much into it. The reasons people become fascinated with the concept is not the same thing as the use that concept has in their lives. In the case of Mormon transhumanism, uh, transhumanism helps people navigate or avoid disruptions to family, friendship networks, and senses of self caused not by a scientific possible future, but by a problematic aspect of a religious past. Anyhow, thanks for uh, listening. This has been Human and sometimes post-human stories. And my name's John Bolesky. Peace and light to you and yours. So I, I, you know, I sometimes do this and do that.